Hi everyone and welcome to this School of English taster session on world building. My name is Dr Nell Perry and I am a lecturer in creative writing here at the University of Kent. I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes about some of the different kinds of approaches to world building, looking at some examples from literature and from popular culture to see what we can learn from them. I'm going to talk about what to consider when building an imaginary world, whether that world is based in reality or not. So to begin with, um, world building is a key part of fiction writing. It is, of course, an important part of writing genres like sci-fi and fantasy and speculative fiction like climate fiction and dystopian fiction. But Real world fiction also has elements of world building in it, and it's useful to know the ins and outs of how it works in either case. It's useful to know about if you're a fan of graphic novels or video games or RPGs, or if you're interested in getting into writing for film and TV. World building is a really important part of the writing process for these media as well. In short, it's a really useful skill to have in your writing toolbox, no matter what kind of writing you like to do. So what is world building? In short, world building is the detailed development of a fictional world or universe. Sounds easy, right? But there are lots of different elements to consider when building a fictional world, as we shall see. But why do we want to do it? What's the purpose of world building? Well, it enables us to create consistent and believable and organic story worlds for our characters to inhabit. It also creates a deep level of immersion for the reader. It's incredibly satisfying to be drawn into a vast and complex story environment, to develop a detailed knowledge of that environment um, and to feel a part of it as a reader. It also adds depth and texture to your story. It transforms what might otherwise feel like a run-of-the-mill human situation, so a rags to riches story um, or a voyage and return or a standard romance into something much more compelling. And a well-crafted story world will provide almost unlimited opportunities for exploration through multiple different stories and points of view. Think, for instance, of how George R. R. Martin explores the fictional uh, world of Westeros in various different book series, or how the Star Wars franchise explores its fictional universe through a variety of different films and TV series. So how do we go about building a fictional world? There are a couple of different approaches. Firstly, there's the choice between an inside out and an outside in approach. An inside out approach, also known as pantsing, because you're effectively flying by the seat of your pants, so to speak, um, is where you build the world as you go, as you write. The benefits of this are that it's less work up front, you don't have to design all the histories and the ecosystems and the geographic details before you begin. And it allows for flexibility and surprises along the way. So you can let your characters drive what happens in the story. The drawbacks are that um, because things aren't clearly designed in advance, things might come across as somewhat less coherent to the reader. It also means that you have to do all of your research on the fly. Um, it potentially increases the possibility of plot holes because you're making things up as you go along. And if you have a great idea halfway into writing your story, you will need to go back and revise everything that came before it to ensure that the idea doesn't feel like it comes out of nowhere. So more revision may be necessary. Then there's the outside in approach, where you create the world in detail first and then build the story within it. This is also known as plotting. 
The benefits of this are that you have a clear sense of the story world before you begin. You'll have a clear sense of where you're going and how your characters will fit within the story world. And you'll have a clear sense of what will and won't work. The drawbacks are that plotting takes time and a lot of work. You'll need to do your research. You might need to create maps. Uh, perhaps you'll want to create a story Bible to outline all of the elements of your story world. And changes can be difficult to implement because everything's more or less set in stone before you begin. Another thing to consider when building your story world is whether you want it to be a real world story or a second world story. A real world story, as the name implies, is set in the real world, but some elements of it are different from our own. They are somehow other. This is common in things like uh, dystopian futures, alternate realities and histories, um, and parallel universes, for example. Whereas a second world story is set in an entirely different fictional world or universe with its own histories, its own geographies, and its own cultures. Those histories and cultures can be based on real world ones, but they're presented as distinctly different. Let me give you some examples. First of all, Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale is an example of a real world world building context. It takes place in New England in America, which is a place in the real world, but it's set in the near future. And America is now a totalitarian state called Gilead. The story takes various elements of the real world and it amplifies them. So it amplifies elements of our existing patriarchal society and a lot of its history mirrors our own. It draws on the real world to create a fictional story world, but it creates elements that don't exist in order to highlight the elements that do. Strict rules of social class and gender are amplified and codified, and there are rigidly enforced social rituals that take place in the story to highlight these heavily gendered real life inequalities. So The Handmaid's Tale is an example of a real world fictional setting. On the other hand, George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire is an epic fantasy series set in an entirely fictional world. It is like our own real world in many ways, but it is also explicitly not the same. To create its rich and detailed world history of dynastic wars for the monarchy, um, George R. R. Martin draws on real world histories and geographies for inspiration. European medieval kings and queens, Hadrian's Wall, the fall of Rome, um, and, and uh, George R. R. Martin mixes these elements with fantasy and magic to distinguish it from the real world. So A Song of Ice and Fire is a second world fictional setting. This brings us to a third set of approaches to world building, hard and soft world building. These terms are not the same as plotting and pantsing that we've already discussed. These are actually um, terms for two different approaches to plotting. The terms should also be distinguished from hard and soft magic systems, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. And these two terms derive from um, a writing and world building YouTube channel called Hello Future Me, uh, run by somebody called Tim Hickson, uh, which you should definitely check out if you're interested in world building. And they describe two very different but equally valid approaches to world building. And don't worry, I'll explain the difference between the two using a bunch of well-known examples. So hard world building is characterized by clear and defined rules and explanations. These kinds of world have detailed cultural histories 
clearly defined geographies and complex social systems. Each of these operate according to systems of logic made clear within the story world. In other words, as readers, we are able to know an extraordinary amount of information about the story world. We will likely know um, hundreds of years of history. Um, we will likely know how each region relates geographically and socioeconomically um, to one another. And these kinds of story worlds are deeply immersive for a reader. They provide enormous amounts of material for us to interpret and engage with. And because of their scale, they are often able to sustain multiple stories. Soft world building, on the other hand, is defined by mystery and enigma. It is defined as much by what is known as by what is not known. A great deal is left up to the imagination of the reader or the viewer, and many elements are left intentionally unexplained. This gives the impression of an implied, vast and unexplored world. Rather than providing all the rich and detailed histories and details, these kinds of world, worlds leave them open to the imagination, because to explain them in depth would take away an element of their mystery. Often these kinds of worlds involve taking a familiar real world setting and somehow making it strange or unfamiliar. This doesn't necessarily mean that worlds made using this approach are real world settings per se, but they are often strange and otherworldly imaginary worlds that are anchored by real world characters in real world situations or with real world problems. We'll look at three examples of each approach and examine the important considerations that writers need to make when adopting one approach or the other. Let's start with Middle Earth. It's difficult to talk about hard world building without mentioning Tolkien because of his enormous influence on the high fantasy genre and the level of detail in his world building strategy. Middle Earth is a continent in the fictional high fantasy world of Arda, um, in which Tolkien's novels, The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit are set. So this is very much a second world setting, even though a lot of its history is based on real world Christian theology and Germanic myth. Tolkien developed his fictional world in extraordinary detail in his Legendarium, a collection of legends outlined in a, a variety, a range of texts, including the Silmarillion, the Book of Lost Tales, and the 12 volume history of Middle Earth. And Tolkien was a philologist. He was a scholar of languages. So he was particularly interested in designing fictional languages for his story world. He created a number of them, um, including Dwarvish, uh, Numenorean, and multiple Elvish languages. And a lot of the world building is concerned with how these languages developed. Another example of hard world building is the fictional universe of Star Wars. Now, we know that a lot of Star Wars world building has been done in what we might call a pantsing mode, developed over time by different creators in the story franchise. And while I'm not sure we can say that Star Wars began as a hard world building setting, it has definitely become one over time with deeply established lore, detailed history and mythos, a complex system of government. Think, for example, about the Galactic Republic, an in intricate system of both metaphysics and magic in the Force, and complex religion and cult systems in the Sith and the Jedi. There are complex trade negotiations and struggles for interplanetary leadership. So this is a second world setting a whole fictional cosmology or universe 
encompassing multiple worlds. And it provides the setting for multiple stories that combine elements of sci-fi and Western genres grounded by hero protagonists whose story arcs follow the hero's journey monomyth. Another contemporary example of hard world building is the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now, again, I'm not sure we can say that the MCU stories began as part of a hard world building system. The movies are based on lots of different comic storylines that have often um, had multiple contradicting uh, storylines and backstories. And as you may know, parts of the franchise have been excluded from the canon uh, because they, they no longer fit in with the world building system that the Marvel Cinematic Universe has established. But drawing on these comic storylines, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has built a complex fictional interconnecting universe with complex systems of magic and technology detailed histories of conflict, um, and clearly defined rules about how these different elements interrelate. It has a real world cosmology, combining alternate reality Earth um, in places like Wakanda and Sokovia with second world settings like Asgard and Sakaar and Xandar. So the Marvel Cinematic Universe has been developed using hard world building, based on multiple fictional worlds. There are lots of other examples of hard world building we could examine particularly from literature, but I'm hoping that these, uh, these examples are well known to people and provide uh, a good sense of the way in which hard world building is characterized by clear and defined explanations for why things happen. Rich and detailed histories and geographies and complex social systems. So if we're creating a fictional setting using hard world building, what sort of things do we need to consider? First of all, you'll need to map out and establish the parameters of your fictional world. You'll need to ask some detailed questions like, what is the system of government? What is the landscape like? What is the climate like? What flora and fauna exist? What are the social structures and the institutions and the cultural rituals and so on? There's a lot of work you'll need to do. But when it comes to translating this into a story, you'll need to be wary of dumping all of this information on the reader right at the beginning. You'll need to find subtle ways of drip feeding it to them in ways that don't feel awkward. And you'll have to choose what's really necessary to divulge. What is interesting and important for a reader to know, for instance, and what is just unnecessary detail? Do they really need to know all the ins and outs of a particular trade negotiation, for example, or is it more interesting for them to know who's plotting to kill who, who, someone else in the story? In contrast, let's look at some examples of soft world building. Now, unlike hard world building, which is characterized by clear and defined rules, soft world building, um, as we've already seen, uh, is defined by mystery and enigma. A large amount of, of the world building is left up to reader imagination or the, the viewer's imagination in order to imply a vast and unexplored world. Hayao Miyazaki's Studio Ghibli films often employ soft world building to create this kind of fictional setting. My Neighbor Totoro, for example, has a real world setting, um, an old house in rural Japan, that has magical and otherworldly qualities that remain largely unexplained. The house is inhabited with soot sprites, for instance, um, the garden is home to small and large spirits, including Totoro. And Totoro travels in a giant cat shaped like a bus. These magical elements are not explained for the audience 
Um, we're not provided with a detailed system of magic or history to which they belong. The details of how these magical elements relate is left largely up to us as the audience. And in contrast um, to these magical elements, the story is grounded in real world characters with real world problems. The two children in the story, Satsuki and Mei, are dealing with the illness and hospitalization of their mother and the difficulties of moving to a new home. The problems and complications arising from moving to a new and strange place is also a grounding element in Neil Gaiman's Coraline. But Coraline is also dealing with parents who are too busy to help with these difficulties. In exploring her new, new home, she encounters a magical door which leads to a parallel world, which includes numerous magical fantasy and otherworldly elements. For instance, she encounters an other mother and other father who have buttons for eyes. There are otherworldly parallels of her quirky neighbors and the local feral cat can talk. These magical elements remain largely unexplained. In the book, uh, there are gestures towards the other mother's supernatural fairy or witch origins, but these are not explained in any great depth or detail. They are, in other words, left up to our imagination. So both Coraline and My Neighbor Totoro are based at least partially in a real world setting that has otherworldly elements. Rob Davis's graphic novel series, The Motherless Oven, however, takes place in a dark fantasy second world setting that borrows many real world characteristics. The rigid systems of class, social control, discipline and government in the graphic novel echo real world systems but are given otherworldly qualities. People celebrate their death day rather than their birthday. The police force is made up of older people who abuse their positions of authority and lock young people away in jars of liquid for supposed crimes and misdemeanors. And every state in the fictional world enforces rules about how people must live and die. There are limited explanations given for the otherworldly elements of the story. The fact that children make their own parents in the motherless oven, uh, the fact that household appliances are gods that sing prophetic songs, or details about the weather control system that causes rain made of knives and laughing wind. We are given some backstory to these elements, but they are never fully explained. And Though there is a timeline of the history of the fictional world in the final book of the series, The Book of Forks, it's left deliberately ambiguous and it raises as many questions as it answers. Like Coraline and My Neighbor Totoro, the Motherless Oven trilogy is grounded in real world characters with real world problems. Not only are the three teenage protagonists negotiating their complex social environments, but they're dealing with issues of mortality and questioning the world that they inhabit. So if we're creating a fictional setting using soft world building, what sort of things do we need to consider? Well, as we've seen in the three examples we've looked at, soft world building is often grounded in real world characters with real problems. This may also be true of hard world building, particularly if you boil the story down to its basics. Think for instance of how in Spider-Man, Peter Parker is often figuring out how to negotiate his identity in the context of high school social dynamics. But in hard world building, these real world character problems are often tied up in large scale epic hero stories and or tropes of genre fiction. To begin a soft world building um, 
form or approach, a good rule of thumb is to start with the real world and look for ways to make it strange and otherworldly. Perhaps like in the motherless oven, you might take real world elements and amplify them. Or like in Coraline, create strange parallels with real world elements. The key thing is with soft world building, don't be tempted to over explain. Mystery and enigma are the key elements of creating your fictional world. Right towards strangeness and away from stereotypes and tropes of genre. You're looking for a fine balance between otherworldliness and familiarity. Or to put it differently, you're aiming to create a story world with its own internal logic that is at its heart erring on the illogical side. But whichever approach to world building you choose, having a sense of what you're building is important. You absolutely can mix genres together. You can make a steampunk, zombie, western space opera, um, or a supernatural fantasy pirate romance. And you can mix approaches to world building too. You can plot parts of it beforehand and fly by the seat of your pants for the rest of it. And you can mix hard world building and soft world building elements together, but there are things you'll need to be mindful of. Firstly, mysterious unexplained elements of soft world building in a fictional world that is otherwise detailed and complex and full of rules may feel inconsistent or come across to readers as a plot hole. Likewise, in reverse, having elements of your story be explained in rigid depth and detail in a fictional world that is otherwise mysterious and otherworldly, as in soft world building, may lose the sense of enigma and mystery that makes it compelling. So it's useful to be clear from the outset what you're going for in your fictional world. Now, before I talk about how to turn your fictional world into a dynamic story, I want to say a thing or two about magic systems, because as with world building, there are two approaches to magic systems in fictional worlds, and it's worth knowing about what differentiates them. Much like hard world building systems, hard magic systems have explicitly stated unbreakable rules about how magic works which the reader is aware of. These rules are underpinned by logic and reasoning. In hard magic systems, magic can be used uh, occasionally to solve characters' problems, to get them out of sticky situations. And the rules about who can and can't use magic are very clear. In a soft magic system, the rules for magic are ambiguous and undefined they are left deliberately unclear. Magic is rarely used to solve problems for characters, and there are not the same fixed rules about who can and can't use magic. Now, it's important to emphasize, firstly, that hard and soft magic systems don't necessarily correspond to hard and soft world building systems. You can have a hard world building system with soft magic and vice versa. So, for instance, the Marvel Cinematic Universe and Star Wars are examples of hard world building with reasonably hard magic systems. While Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones are examples of hard world building with soft magic systems. The Harry Potter franchise is a good example of soft world building with a hard magic system, as is Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials series of books. While Hayao Miyazaki's Studio Ghibli films, uh, like My Neighbor Totoro, um, are an example of soft world building with soft magic systems. And secondly, hard and soft magic systems are not two firm categories. They operate more like a spectrum or a sliding scale with one at either end. 
the magic system in Star Wars is probably probably more rigid and firmly established than that in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, for instance. So we could plot all of these examples across the sliding scale from hard to soft magic system. <clears throat> but regardless of whether you choose a hard or soft magic system, fantasy and sci-fi author Brandon Sanderson has some useful rules for using magic in your stories. The first rule states that an, an author's ability to solve conflict with magic is directly proportional to how well the reader understands said magic, which basically means you should try to avoid <clears throat> you should try to avoid using magic as a convenient plot device to get your characters out of trouble. The second rule states that weaknesses, limits, and costs are more interesting than powers, which basically means that the best stories arise from what the magic can't do, because conflict arises from character flaws rather than character strengths. The third rule states that the author should expand on what is already a part of the magic system before something entirely new is added as this may otherwise entirely change how the magic system fits into the fictional world. This basically means that a few clear and connected magical elements are more believable than lots of disconnected ones, and that you're better off expanding what you've already established before you add something new. And the final rule, numbered zero, is that you should always err on the side of what's awesome, which I think is self-explanatory. So now that we've established which approaches to world building you can take and what your options are for creating systems of magic, how do you turn the fictional world you have built into an engaging story? One thing to consider to ease your readers into your fictional world is to consider having a newcomer point of view character who will operate as the eyes of the reader. It's a more credible way of having complicated elements explained than having big exposition dumps or having things explained to characters who should by rights already know them. As we've already seen, it's also a good rule of thumb to anchor your world with compelling characters who have real world relatable problems. Even at the heart of the most high fantasy or epic space opera is a character who's dealing with something relatable. Luke Skywalker, for instance, just wants to escape his humdrum life on his uncle's farm, which I think we can all relate to. It's also useful to remember that each of your characters will have very different feelings about every aspect and element of your fictional world. They'll have different motivations and ways of seeing things. And they will tell very different stories about the same events. This is where a good deal of the story's conflict will arise. And that conflict will drive your story forward. And finally, be mindful not to reproduce real world stereotypes within your fictional world. Many, many fantasy and sci-fi writers, Tolkien is a perfect example of this, um, have been criticized for reproducing racial or orientalist stereotypes in order to establish so-called facets of otherness in their world building or of reproducing gender stereotypes like the damsel in distress trope or the heartless female assassin trope or the manic pixie dream girl with no space for complexity and three-dimensional character facets. So look for ways to circumvent or better still to challenge and subvert these stereotypes. Your story will be richer for it. And after all of your painstaking world building, how much of your world do you reveal to your reader in the story itself? Well, it's important to remember that the worldview, 
i.e. what you know about the story that you have made, about the world that you've created, is not the same as the story view, um, i.e. what the reader knows about that world that you have created. The reader doesn't need to know every small detail that you've come up with in your world building design. Do they really need to know, for instance, about how the sewer system is designed? Well, for instance, in Game of Thrones, yes, it's integral to both Tyrion's story arc and to his plan to capture Castle Rock. So yes, that is a, a detail that needs to be included. But in Star Wars, in the Death Star, for instance, do we need to know about who built the sewer system? Probably not, not so much. So the question is always, is this information integral to the story? And not all of your characters will know everything about the story world either. Different characters will have different levels of knowledge and understanding. A character who knows everything at the start of the story will have no space to grow and learn. This is why a little mystery is important, even in hard world building. Ernest Hemingway had a theory in his own writing that might be usefully applied to world building. His iceberg theory states that most of the story should remain under the surface, i.e. invisible to the reader, with, with only about one eighth of what the writer knows being revealed. This isn't meant to imply that how much you reveal is an exact science. Different amounts will work for different kinds of stories. But it's useful to know that keeping information back is a common practice for all kinds of writers. I'm going to end by signposting some of the optional modules here at Kent that might be of interest if you're passionate about world building. There's the first year module Other Worlds, Dystopias and Futures, available to literature students which looks at a range of speculative fiction, including science fiction, climate fiction, and apocalypse fiction with a critical lens. There's the second year module, Interactive and Immersive Fictions, which is a practical module available to literature students and creative writing students in which you will work collaboratively in order to explore interactive and immersive um, writing forms, things like video games, escape room games, alternate reality games and immersive theatre, among many, many other things. There's the second year creative writing module Elements of Fiction, uh, in which you'll learn more about the technical elements of fiction writing, things like point of view and plot and characterization. And then there's the third year creative writing module The Book Project, in which students have the opportunity to self-publish their own book of creative work, whether it's fiction or poetry, and that would give you the opportunity to self-publish your own um, fantasy or dystopian um, or sci-fi um, piece of fiction. So here at Kent, there are a number of opportunities in which you would be able to explore world building even further, whether that be creatively or critically. That's the end of my talk. Um, thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, if you have any further questions about this topic or about creative writing at Kent, please do get in touch. My, uh, my email is up on the screen now. Um, I would be very happy to hear from you and very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>